Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us, everyone. This is uh, another episode of the Pastel Society of Southern California. We are uh, honored and thrilled uh, that you could join us. Um, we are in the month of November. Uh, we had a few things in October. We had uh, Mike Butkus uh, showing some scary monsters for Halloween theme. Um, this month, we are kind of carrying on the uh, tradition of Dios de lo, lo, los Muertos um, and the idea of um, magic, enchantment. Um, we have a great uh, artist and a PSSC member, um, Daniel Gonzalez is with us. And I got to talk to him last night. He's a wonderful, wonderful person. I really admire his art and um, we're gonna get a little introspect into him tonight. Um, Daniel, I am, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, make sure that you have everything you need. Um, without further ado, we are going to turn it over to Daniel. Hey everybody, thank you for making it tonight. Salud, good spirits to you all. I hope you have some good spirits or wine or whatever to stay hydrated. Um, all right, here, salud. Um, I'm gonna get started with, uh, let's see. Uh, just a welcome. Thank you all for making it. I know it's uh, these crazy times, but uh, we're navigating our digital arenas as best as we can. And I think it's great to connect with people in multiple time zones. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my artwork tonight and share some stories, answer questions, and I can do a little bit of painting demo. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm going to do a little presentation, like a little slideshow. It didn't take very long at all, but I'll do that and then uh, and then we'll get rid of the slideshow. So it's not going to last too long. So don't worry about that. Um, let me see. Share content. My screen. Podcast. I have to uh, talk to myself with the instructions, or I <laughs> don't know what I'm doing. Um, so give me one second while I, okay, can everybody see the Calavera painting workshop screen? Yes, Daniel. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Just checking. So this is a quick little presentation. What? Oh, sorry. If you guys aren't uh, on mute, I appreciate it. Um, I'll, I'll have an opportunity to ask questions in a bit. Um, all right, so let's just turn it. This is me, the media artist. Somebody's watching the game or something. But, um, <laughs> Take care of that. Uh, Dave, you might be able to mute all and then unmute Daniel. You got it. Yes. Okay, thanks for that. You might be able to spotlight him as well. Um, but that he doesn't need to do that right now because he's showing slides. Okay, cool. This is little me with all of my sass on the horse. And you know, I love that pose. Maybe I'll paint it one day. This is some things that I like and some things that I don't like. Um, I'm a fan of the Southwest. It's where I grew up on the Navajo reservation and along the US Mexico border. I love the desert. Um, I'm a dog person. I've become very fond of outer space. My wife is a space nerd and um, it was just really nice to learn about the cosmos with her. Um, I love running, tennis and campfires and uh, some things I don't like are mosquitoes, um, mos you know, leaky mustard when you get the mustard and it's just like leaks all over your food. I hate that. Um, movie theater talkers, that kind of thing. Um, there's a picture of me drawing. Um, some of my strengths as an artist, you know, I, I strive to be true to myself and, and not lose what makes me happy. And what, what that has done is, is kind of steer me in these three different categories. I love painting calaveras. I feel like they are uh, imaginative. They really exercise my creativity and they're kind of a uh, appear, peering into like my, my dreams and my imagination and these metaphysical emotions that I want to express and explore. 
the Western art I do, that's more of um, exploring my identity as a, uh, a Mexican Apache growing up in the Southwest. And, uh, you know, I grew up on farms working with cattle and livestock. And so at the time growing up in that stuff, it's not so great. But looking back, it's always like really fond and reminiscent. And I'm like, oh, man, I love the Southwest. And I got to paint every, every uh, I, you know, icon of the Southwest that I can find now. And the figurative stuff is, it's always been there. I have always loved painting people. It's always a challenge, but it always further hones my skill above everything else. Whenever I paint the figure, I need to be completely present and there and really do my best. And it's, um, it, it's always a mystery. So there's always more to learn. Uh, these are some recent works. I try and also get out and do some plain air stuff. I'll do um, still lifes, this still life here. You know, it's a commentary on, on COVID. I can't wait to hang, hang up my mask, but, but uh, when I'm outside painting, I'm playing, you know, I try and stay fresh, try and stay challenged, um, try and practice. I'll use different mediums too. Like this is a block print I recently did. Um, it's fun. And, I, and I'll do digital stuff too. Like this is a Calavera uh, pattern with the signs of the Zodiac, you know? Um, so that might become, you know, a, a shower curtain. Who knows? Who knows what people will put this design on? Oh, that's uh, just a picture of the block cutting. Why? I don't know why that's there again. Uh-oh. <laughs> anyway, moving on, my creative process. I, I start off with research and sketches, thumbnails and little scribbles that I usually don't show people or before I didn't like showing people. You know, I was a little embarrassed because they looked like chicken scratch. And then I found that, um, if I knew it was gonna to go to somebody, I would take more care. So that's why I sketch on postcards now. I know that it's going to somebody and somebody will see it. So I'm really like, oh God, I better do a better job. After I do a thumbnail or a sketch, I'll do a color sketch and then I'll do a final painting. Uh, some inspirational research methods, you know, just the way I go about it. I'll start with a word list sometimes, you know, the thing, list of, you know, stars moon, cactus, birds, whatever. And that'll conjure a uh, composition or an emotion. Um, I'll go visit a museum, find some artwork sometimes that's really inspirational. And even on a long run, I'll, I'll, get, I'll be inspired or in the shower afterwards, just like standing there, just, you know, when I'm unplugged, um, you know, I think that's important. Ideas will come to you when you're unplugged. And then I ask, you know, how do you guys get creative? And hopefully we can talk about that in a little bit. My tools, I just use it, anything I can grab really. Um, I've, I have some preferences and we'll get into like brands later, you know, if you wanna talk about, you know, brands and, you know, specific types, but really I, I just kind of grab whatever is around me, whatever I have at the time. Everything from pencils, charcoal, oil paint, watercolor gouache, and different varnishes and stuff. This is what I mean, like from a sketch to a painting. So the sketch is, <laughs> I like the sketch. I can work out my ideas. It's really, um, I think I've, I've come to love them, but uh, during the process, it's self-doubt is always there on my shoulder, looking at the sketch going like, oh my God, like, how am I ever gonna do this? Um, so I've learned to love the process. Here's an example of like a postcard to a finished painting. Um, the sketch on the postcard is very rough and loose. And then I'll explore colors and composition, tightening it up with gouache and ink. And on the far right, you'll see Frida Kahlo as a final oil painting with, with the realized anatomy. But I, I don't make the anatomy um, too anatomical. That, that when I do that, I feel like it, it gets too macabre. And while I'm doing this, I'm also researching. I'm like, like looking at photos of Frida and I'm going, oh my gosh, I don't like that chain. It's too obstructive. You know, I'll just uh, get rid of it. And the flowers, I want to be more of a day of the dead theme. So I put marigolds instead of the cactus or the calla lilies. So 
you know, I'm, I'm constantly going back to my research and learning about a culture that I don't know or a holiday that I'm, you know, still, still learning about. Now, this is a video. I decided, I was like, should I show this video? Should I not show this video? And I think I'll show it, but I'm gonna scrub through it and just say, I have documented my process on YouTube and you can watch it there if you want, um, but I will not make you suffer through a video <laughs> <laughs> right now, um, the whole thing. We're just gonna fast forward it really quick. So Hello, we well, welcome back. My name's Daniel we Gonzalez. To, uh, In this video, I'm sharing my process on how I painted Siesta Luna. Switched up the legs here because they look. So I draw <laughs> the skeleton. Uh, too academic. I want it to be playful and have the feeling that it's imagined. The skeleton. And after I draw the skeleton, clear gesso. I put clear gesso on top. I know this is probably overkill. You know, to just protect the drawing. Some artists only use the fixative. Even I just use the fixative sometimes. But I wanted to sandwich it between a layer of clear gesso. I don't know. After I do that, um, you know, playing with the warm and cool. Paint the background. And work all the angles. And this is how I usually put stars down. You can see my technique for spattering stars all over my painting. I'm sure to do it outside so I don't make a mess inside. I think one of the problems, uh, one of the things to figure out for painting is to definitely figure out the order of things that you're going to paint. Just trying to. And so after I make the stars, um, I, I'll then find my light source, which is always the heart of the whole painting. And doing that helps me envision where the light is. So when I paint the light source, I get an understanding of the direction and everything. Oop, what is going on? Play. Moon surface to be pockmarked with craters, and it was really helpful knowing where the light source was to envision all that. And you can see I'm just using value. You know, I'm using black and white, really just kind of working on values. Where the light source is, it's going to be brighter, and where, where it's further away from the light source, it's going to fade. After I get the values down on the moon, I let it dry so I could paint a transparent overlay of blue for the moon. Here you can see my setup and my palette. It is a gradient, you know, basically warm and cool gradients, and I'm using linseed oil to help the paint flow. I don't make them. And so you can see, I'll, I'll just paint it after that. And there's the oh, finish. I really enjoyed painting this and stay tuned for more videos, guys. Thanks. All right. So, sorry, I'm trying to go forward. Oh, what is happening here? All right. Now, thank you for um, being patient with me there. <laughs> Iconography. You know, I, I look at the culture of the Southwest the, and I, I try and stay creative with it. And I, I approach it with a lot of care. This was a really interesting um, conversation I had uh, with my friend who is a great Western artist. He, he actually paints um, these beautiful pictures of Native Americans in the Southwest, even though he's not Native American. And he was asked, you know, um, how do you do it? You know, with the cultural appropriation being, you know, observed right now, I, I think it's relevant to have those kind of conversations. And he answered that, you know, he's more of a historian and he approaches it with a lot of uh, reverence and respect for the culture. And I think that's a good way to go about it. I don't think it excludes him from painting Native Americans just because he's not Native American. I mean, I'm not British, but if I wanted to paint a knight in armor, you know, I shouldn't have to be British to do it. I think as long yes, as you, you should. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
spoken from a true Brit. Thank you, Bernard. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, Bernard, just a reminder. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the reminder. Um, but I, I think as long as you approach something with with some reverence and respect, and and uh, you don't try and and I don't know mistreat it or misuse it, uh, I think I think that's the way to go about it. And so with a lot of these skeletons I paint, you know, I'm learning about Day of the Dead every every time. You know, it's a Dia de los Muertos is a big holiday in Mexico, and and it's um, different in, in all the different places of Mexico and celebrated differently. When I paint these skeletons, it was never really Day of the Dead. They were all about narratives that I was exploring and some metaphysical um, ideas I had that I'll talk about a little bit later, but people connect them. You know, they go, oh, this is Day of the Dead artwork. And so I think, you know, knowing that I'm, I try and learn a bit more about it just to educate myself. Um, some questions so far. Well, we'll just move those to the end since we're almost at the end. But I would recommend books, um, and I'll talk about that later, and references. I've been using Instagram and Pinterest a lot. Um, common themes in my artwork, stargazing is one. Uh, like I said earlier, my, my wife Jackie and I would go out and, and we'd stargaze. Uh, for our dates, you know, it was free and it was Tucson. Tucson has a really nice night sky. And she was really interested, still is, in space. And she would point out all the different things. And that emotion and, and those moments stayed with me and they, they're reoccurring in my artwork. And so is playing music and the idea of journey and play and rest. I, I talked a little bit about anatomical versus stylized. I, in my artwork, the line is always shifting on how playful I want the image to be. If I want it to be really playful and inviting, I'll make it more stylized. And if I feel like I can make it more anatomical um, and elevate it a little bit more, I'll do that. But I never want my skeletons to seem macabre or, or scary, really. The whole idea behind painting Calaveras for me comes from the idea that when when you're around, you know, your hair, your, your, your physical being, that goes away. And the way people will remember you is the way you made them feel. And when I was first doing these portraits, the one on the left titled Mi Cancion is a self-portrait. And at the time I was really thinking about, oh, how am I gonna do a self-portrait? Like, what am I? <laughs> if I lose my arm, am I less of myself, you know? So what's real? And I, I, I came to the conclusion that what's real is the way I, I treat people, the emotions I leave with people, because that's how they're going to remember me. And that's what that ether represents going through the heart. That's why the heart is a light source. It's supposed to uh, show a great reverence for life. You know, the, the iconography of the Southwest, you know, is like a skull and bones and desert and growing up with Day of the Dead. Um, Skeletons were never really a, totally about death. They are more about remembering your loved ones and almost poking fun at something that's so um, persistent. But for, for me, it was easy to kind of use a skeleton to say, hey, you know, what really matters is stuff you leave behind. Um, yeah. Well done. yeah. And oh, there's my here, some artwork and You'll see just some weird ones that I figured I'd talk about. This one was a four foot by eight foot painting. I went to Bulgaria for a while and I loved it there. The, there were some kids who made bows and arrows on the edge of the banks of the Danube River on the that green strip going through the painting, like on the top third, that's Romania. That's on the other side of the Danube River. And we were in Bulgaria and these kids were having a blast, like making bows and arrows. <laughs> And um, they were asking me because they, they knew I was part of Apache and they were like, how do you do it? And I was showing them how to do it. And, and it was a blast. We had a blast. And that same night, there was like the Perseid meteor shower was happening. And so I get back to Colorado where I'm living at the time after my time there. And, and this composition kind of conjured itself in my dreams. And it was shooting stars over the Danube. 
it, it was lost in a fire, so I'll have to repaint it. But <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I, I thought I'd share that story. Sometimes I'll get commissions that are really kind of bizarre at first. And somebody says, hey, I want I want some of your calaveras on a guitar. And can you include a penguin, a cat and a turtle? And I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? And uh, it's easy for me to say no. Like, no, I don't want to. You know, it's crazy. But I'll say yes often and challenge myself. And um, and sometimes it's it's a kind of magical result, you know. This is another example of a commission. This is one of the first designs I did. This is the first design I did for Roger Klein and the Peacemakers, a band that I've done a lot of artwork for, including a couple album covers and t-shirts and posters and such. But this was an example of, hey, Daniel, can you paint a skeleton surfing on sand dunes where the ocean meets the desert? <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah, let me, <laughs> let me figure that one out. Um, so anyway, this is my Instagram, my Facebook, and YouTube. It's all Daniel's artwork. So I guess I got lucky there. And uh, yeah, that's it. And I can, we can talk now. So let me get this. <laughs> oh God, how do I get this off? How do I, am I in control or are you guys in control? You are. Um, oh. Do you want me to take, because we're going we're gonna to watch you paint for a little bit. Um, for the rest of the time and then do a little Q&A if that's what you want to do. Uh, we can absolutely do that. Um, there we go. Stop okay. share. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I got a camera here where you can see my hand. I'll be painting this little. Yeah, that's great. Skeleton guy. And, and it's my phone so I can like zoom out and talk about stuff. But can you also see me talking to you guys? Yes. Yeah, you guys can do the split screen. Cool. Awesome. I think so, we've got okay. you pinned right now. If anyone doesn't, um, you're going to want to pin um, Daniel's view from his. That's from your iPhone? Yeah, I got my phone okay. here. Perfect. And, and I'm going to paint this while I tell stories and talk and share and ask you guys questions. Do you want to do you want to run through uh, your palette or what you're using any of your materials before we start? Um, yeah, so this is a, a wood, a wood panel that I, I gessoed and I, I, I painted a grisaille on there, a black and white painting first. Um, this is my lovely palette, pretty simple. I got white, yellow, um, orange and ochre, like a orange ochre there. Cadmium red, alizarin, some purples, ultramarine blue. I love Prussian blue. And then my greens and then other colors I'm mixing as I go. And like there's red and then there, there's a string of lighter orange red. That's, that's mixed with orange and red. I try and avoid using white to lighten everything and black to darken everything because that makes it, you know, uh, lose its chroma or I don't know if I'm using the words right. It makes it lose its color mm -hmm. or it makes it look chalky. So I, I try and stay within the family of the color when I'm, when I'm making them uh, lighter and darker in value. So yeah, and the brushes I'm using, I'll use a hog hair brush when I start. I like using hog hair brushes because they can push the paint around. And so like uh, this Escoda brush there, you can see it on that screen. Um, it's dirty, but <laughs> it's a hog hair brush and it'll really lay the paint down nicely. And then after that, I'll use uh, softer brushes um, like uh, this guy, like a sable or a synthetic to finish the paint. That's something that's been really um, important to me. I, I feel like I didn't learn that until later. <laughs> like, oh, I need to use stiff brushes first and soft brushes later. Um, so that's been helpful. And, and here, I, I have it up here. Like this, when I'm, okay, so this is a plain air painting. This is a uh, plain air. I did this a nocturne at night. You know, I was out in the desert and I painted this at night. And then same thing with this one right here. 
and this one. And I have these next to me so I can show you guys that I use this to help me um, paint this because I don't, you know, the, the skeleton hanging upside down, waving high at a cow, you know, that that's all from imagination. But if I don't do plein air painting, um, I'm not going to really have a good guide for color mapping, you know? Right. And so I, I do a lot of studies from life to inform my, my imagination. Like this one here, you know, this is a little bit more finish. Some skeletons holding hands, nice romantic walk, you know, among the saguaros. Um, I'll actually look on Instagram, like hashtag saguaro and find like a ton of saguaros to paint. I, I use Instagram as a powerful search engine. Um, yeah. And when I paint this, I usually go dark to dark to light, except on the ribs, I go light to dark for the most part. Um, and I, I'll show you why. So this is a finer brush because I'm getting really, really tight in there. Yeah. I mean, you learn the rules and then you break them, right? <laughs> oh, and drying medium. I usually use just yeah. this you know, Sorry, the food. To help the paint run. And then sometimes if I'm in a rush, you got to shake it up a little bit. Careful with this because it smells good. Um, I don't know if you guys can read that, but that is Damar Stand Oil Turpentine and Cobalt Dryer. It's like a very traditional mixture and it's uh, the ratios are there that I use. And an artist named Ron Riddick uh, showed me this. He's a prolific Western artist. And anyway, it, it really helps me uh, go through these paintings and help them, you know, let the paint dry, put on another layer, that kind of thing. So. Daniel, what kind of timeline do you have with that cobalt dryer? Timeline? Yeah, like how long do you usually have before it's completely dry? Oh, okay, if it's thin, if it's a thin application, it'll be dry, but you know, if I did it in the morning, it'll be dry by the, by the late afternoon. And okay. Yeah, if it's <laughs> thicker, it might be a day or two. Yeah, Co cobalt dryer is, you know, you don't want to, I have, I always have these little things right here, these little cups. So here's linseed oil and I leave that open, but I, my cobalt dryer, I put it in there and then cap it. You don't want to be messing around with that. Okay. And you don't really need it unless you're like, you know, you got commissions, you got to run, you know, your deadlines are, are leaning on you really heavy. Um, and then I use Gamsol in this jar. Um, and it's covered most of the time. I just use that to clean my brushes. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. And I wanted to ask you guys, just chime in, like, because I always find this interesting. Like, what are some of your methods for getting creative? Like, how do you get, how do your creative thoughts come to you? I mean, I was good. Go ahead. Well, I was good. This is Lynn. Hey, Lynn. Hi. Um, I can turn on my video for a second. I was gonna say I um did this sushi cat painting, which was really something different that I'd never done before. And I was actually sitting in the sushi bar, and I started sketching on the placemat, and I started envisioning the sushi chefs as cats, and my imagination just went wild and I ended up doing a sushi cat painting. It's called Seven Days of Sushi, which was totally from my imagination with reference photo right from the sushi bar. And I don't know where it came from, but I love that you have these three categories. And I wanted to ask you about that because I'm typically more like a Western artist. I paint representational or impressionistic, you know, landscapes in Western art, cows, horses. I do people, I, I love painting all subjects. So I'm glad to see that you have three different categories of things because sometimes people will say, oh, you should only be known for one thing and you should focus on the one thing that people know you for. So they can say, that's a Lynn Attic or that's a Daniel Gonzalez. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. 
That's and how you came to all three. No yeah. way. That's a good question. Like, I, I mean, I've been told that also. I'm like, oh, you know, you got to pick one thing, <laughs> you know, and and do that. And I, I can't. I got to stay fresh. And and part of that is really um, being true to myself. I've been told like, oh man, your calaveras are great. You should do that. Or, oh, your Westerns are great. You should just do that. <laughs> I feel like um, I'm going to just do what makes me happy and, and, and stay the course and, and just trust the process. You know, um, it's, <laughs> it, it's really funny. Um, I just got done listening to an interview um, with Joe Rogan and Jewel and, <laughs> Joe Rogan. and you know like I she talks about her creative process a bit and how it's been um difficult but rewarding for her to stay her course in her music and and I feel like that's that's something I think artists need to hear sometimes because it is tempting to just you know uh take the easier out and see the success full path and be like oh I could do that but is that your path you know and uh you gotta stay in your swim lane kind of kind of you know yeah. there's only one of you go to sleep I remember a, a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson he uh he was talking about the difference between mathematics and and art and he's like you know in mathematics if Einstein didn't get to e equals mc square somebody would have somebody eventually would have gotten to e equals mc squared because mathematics and science they follow a particular course and it's a language and you know it goes in that direction but if i don't know like uh, i think you used van gogh. if van gogh didn't paint starry night you know nobody would have you know so there's only one of you and you gotta you gotta be true to yourself and so i think that's really important um yeah This brush is done. This brush is so frayed. So what I'm doing down, I'm putting like a medium value of orange, and I'm painting the back rib ribs first. Um, and then you can imagine on top of those ribs, I'll be painting um, the sternum and the uh, other, you know, the front of those ribs. It's just like I said, like figuring out the order in which you're going to paint things is, is one of the hardest <laughs> things to visualize sometimes. And then like even now I have to go back and paint something in and go back and forth. But I have this example I did for a kid's workshop that I can show you that really spells it out. <laughs> so this is what I did for a kid's workshop. Um, and you can see like the yellow is is just like a line and then the yellow ribs. And then on top of that, this is marker, you draw the ribs that are in the front. And so it looks like the heart's in the middle, you know? And it's the same concept with um, oil paint. And so when I'm painting, I'm trying to envision, you know, the steps that I need to take to get to a certain part. Yeah. And I'm like the heart, the heart comes next. All right. Yeah. And this is little stuff. Um, it's funner to paint the big stuff, you know, like this little stuff you gotta be careful. But I try and put a heart in all of my skeletons. It's a powerful symbol. <clears throat> I had an interview with a student earlier today and yeah. Uh, what what surprised me about my paintings, you know, that somebody told me, and I'll never forget the time a person came up to me and said, like, I can put myself in your paintings because it's just a skeleton, you know. Um, that was pretty cool. I never really thought of it like that before, but they felt like they could put themselves in any of my paintings because it was just a skeleton. I think they're right that way. Uh, yeah, this is Carolyn. I can't see what you're working on. I can uh, see you. 
and the paintings mm -hmm. behind you, but I cannot see what you're working on. Is it a different camera? I should be. Carolyn, yeah, it should be. Um, it should be. Uh, oh, like a, a, on the top or something. Yeah, like it should be square. Daniel's iPhone. Dave, okay. can you can you spotlight? Um, can you spotlight the iPhone? It should be uh, spotlighted already. Oh, okay. Um, I see it. Okay. So now you do. Okay, great. Um, a, a compromise might be Dan. Yeah. Daniel Gonzo. What's Could up? you move your camera slightly to the left to include your canvas? Is that possible? Molly, will you shut up? Get what, over it. what camera? This one? Yes. There like you go. That. That's it. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. I think you're you're also on if you want to pin Bernard's, if you want to pin Daniel's iPhone 8 Plus, that's probably a better yes. view to the entire canvas. Uh, I do have a choice, but okay. I thought um the one with uh, including Daniel and the canvas was uh, much more informative to me. So thank you for doing that. Hope it didn't interrupt the flow. No, I'm, I can I can paint like I like painting and talking. You know, it's funny. Like, <laughs> do you, do you <laughs> chew gum? No, no. But I I I try, I try not to eat anymore or <laughs> or you know indulge myself too much while I'm doing painting but it's so funny like at the atelier everybody's so quiet and everybody you know I spent a year at, up in Seattle painting at the atelier and everybody's so quiet and they all got their headphones on and everybody's really focused and I just remember like just telling myself all right control yourself like don't start a conversation like <laughs> you know like people are focused you don't want to you know be annoying but I, I, I can talk and paint. I like, I like to, to, you, well, you, you, did, you did a great job, Daniel. Thanks. Hey, Charles, woo! <laughs> What's oh up, man? Charles? Oh. Are we allowed to talk out of turn here? Are we? Uh, <laughs> oh, Lou, what's going on, Lou? Hey, I was going, yeah. a few things that you touched on earlier is uh, you talked about uh, only concentrate on one okay. thing. I got uh, okay. my younger child here. Okay. But nice. uh, Daniel's, yeah. Daniel's always been that 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 person that's you know is a jack of all trades and can paint, can play sports, and paint your back porch if you if you let him. And over the years, excuse my child in the back. Love um, his paintings have inspired my my daughter that I've shared with him through messages and stuff to inspire her to start painting and she's she's young but i have a few of her paintings that i gotta pull off the refrigerator that uh daniel has inspired her to start yeah. painting and she just paints different genres she paints different characters when i show her the characters and uh yeah. i mean this guy knows what he's talking about not just because i know him but the amount of detail, the amount of time he spends on his paintings is just unbelievable. Oh, man. Thanks. You'll have to send me some of her pictures, man. Some of her uh, artwork. That's awesome. We went to high school together. So, yeah, we go way back. And, uh, man, it's good to hear. That, man, it's it's inspiring. to. It's very humbling when, you, when I hear that, man. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, so now I'm painting in the eyes just to help me kind of envision what's going on. I don't usually paint skeletons upside down, so I'm tempted to turn it right side up um, and continue. Um, but you guys can see the basic uh, format um, of painting the back to the front. Like that's the way I'm going about it. Daniel, can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. What what is the definition, or how would you define cavalier, cavaleros, or however you pronounce that term? What does that mean exactly? Calaveras. Yeah, cal calaveras means skeleton, or you know, skulls. Uh, yeah, skulls. Um, it's a uh, it's a general term I use to describe the artwork I'm making. Let me try and get this camera there. I feel like um, 
when I say skeleton artwork, it takes on the context of, you know, just death, like, oh, it's a skeleton, it's death. But right. NFS, you know, kind of connects it a little bit more to, to the culture of the Southwest and the, the ideas that skeletons aren't just about death. They, they have a great reverence for life and they remind people of, you know, that a culture that celebrates, you know, remembering their, their loved ones with Dia de los Muertos. So that's why I use the word calavera. Yeah, okay. you know, I think the movie Coco did such a terrific job of educating yes. a lot of people to that particular uh, custom. It's just absolutely wonderful movie. Oh yeah, I agree. I I felt like I should have been consulted for that. Instead, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were insulted. <laughs> oh man, I I love that movie. I oh man, I I cried. This, the grandma reminded me of my nana. You know, I was like, oh my Aww. god. <laughs> it is a wonderful movie. I've watched it about three times. I could watch it again. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just just the best. Um, I, I, you know, I've always thought like, oh, I really want to work at Disney or Netflix or something. And then after talking to a lot of artists who have worked at Netflix and Disney and such, they're like, oh, you're doing what I want to do. I want to do art full time, you know, um, do my own art. And so it's, it's good to hear that because, you know, I, like I say, uh, the imposter syndrome kind of creeps in sometimes. You're like, oh man, what am I doing? Am I on my path? Like what, am, you know, um, what, do I, what else do I need to be doing? But um, as long as I keep staying the course, um, I feel positive. And so right now, like looking at the anatomy here, um, I realize I missed a rib, so I'll just paint another ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not making it too real. This is this this one is about you know a skeleton saying hi to a bull, just kind of a surprise and, and funny way. I feel like my Western art is starting to meet my Calavera art around saguaros. They're like these monolithic uh meeting places in the desert they have always been so magical to me like they the desert's so flat all the everything is so efficient in the desert you know the cactus the grasses the tobosa grass the gamma grass like the and they're they're like all really efficient and small and then you have these monolithic saguaros just standing up <laughs> in the desert i like, like stonehenge yeah, yeah, they're just huge, and and so they've crept, they've made their way into my artwork, and I feel like a lot of my Western art is meeting my my Calavera art now at at the Suaro, and it just kind of happened organically. So I'll just keep doing that and kind of see where it goes. Nice. Yeah. Um, another thing is the colors with these Calaveras. It's very saturated. I love the colors. Whenever I do like a limited palette painting, let me show you. This is I did this this last summer, but um, using like two colors, and um, you know, you use two colors: ultramarine blue and uh, what is this burnt sienna and and white. You can get a lot of colors that way, but they're all kind of within the family and stuff. But with the, with my calaveras, I, I kind of go crazy. I, I just love it. I have a lot of fun playing with different colors and um, just experimenting and playing around. And I you know really I really feel your joy in it. <laughs> thanks. It's there's a lot of joy I get from it. Um, so now I'll paint the top colors, the top ribs. So if you're looking at my little calavera there. So what I'll do is I'll paint the sternum right here. Ah, it's so small. I don't know why I chose such a small one to paint <laughs> for the demo. It was just the one I was working on. Um, so there's like the sternum and then I'll do the top rib. <laughs> I'm laughing at myself because I'm, I'm now realizing just how small uh, this is. <laughs> oh my God. Why did I do this to myself? All right. All right. 
Yeah. I th this is like one of the smallest uh, skeletons I've painted in oil paint. Yeah, joy. Great, I'm glad it's working. Um, I also wanted to talk about like uh, common compositional elements in my, in my Calavera paintings. I often have prickly pear at the bottom and they kind of serve, they serve a purpose there. They aren't just decorative at the bottom. Um, I always like the idea of these calaveras being kind of magical. And for the viewer who kind of walks in on this painting to not interrupt the painting, like they're peering over the prickly pears in the front, you know, not interrupting the painting, just not interrupting the scene. They're just kind of like checking it out. And it, it, I think it keeps the scene sacred. I think it, um, I think it's also like uh, kind of frames it it's in its own way. I remember when I was too poor to uh, buy frames, I would paint the frame on the canvas. <laughs> and part of that was using, um, oh, I did put the right number of ribs. I didn't need that one. Um, so this painting right here behind me is one of the ones from college that I actually painted the came on so you oh. can see like that oh that's very cool that's the canvas right there i love that that's a great idea thanks and so yeah i've done that in the past and i think i'm gonna start doing that again i love that that's super thanks but but you can see like how the the prickly pear up there they are they are a barrier between not a barrier there's just like a separation between the the scene and the viewer and and that's that's important to me i like to feel like the viewer is peering over into something magical it and, seems to me it kind of isolates daniel it isolates the characters away from the viewer you know creates some space for them yeah thanks i i like that um, you know, because there's there's certain methods artists use. Like I learned a lot about it in photography when I was taking photography. Like if you have a person in the foreground with their back to you, that kind of like welcomes you in to the photograph or the scene. And if somebody's just looking straight at you, it's kind of confrontational. But because it's a photograph, you can keep looking. Like. Like if you see a photograph with some figures in the foreground and their back is to you, you, you almost feel like you're part of that crowd. Heavy. Uh, I gotta... Go ahead, yeah. I know you're comfy. Let's see, another thing I was talking about, it's like um, when I paint a portrait, I like the portraits of people just confronting the viewer, very like looking directly at them because it's it's a way to like really look at somebody because when you're when in reality in re, you know every day you're you're seeing people you don't you know it's impolite to stare and even connecting eyes for a, a second is awkward enough where I'll look away you know but um but in a painting you can really look at somebody and you can really you know, study the human expression and go deeper. And, and I, I love that about portraits. So when I paint people, I, I like to paint their face and um, them looking at the viewer. It's like a three, three people in there. It's the artist, the sitter, and the viewer. Yeah. Um, I wonder, Daniel, I don't know if everybody here knows what an accomplished sculptor and potter you are and how when I first met you maybe 12 years ago now um, that was the, the the medium that you were most prolific uh, with and and certainly um, I have a few <laughs> of uh, of Daniel's pieces here at my home even and they um, 
they have the same kind of, I think, emotional connection for me that I'm seeing obviously in your work uh, with, with brushes and paint now. And I wonder if that was purposeful or if it was more um, because you've been traveling more and relocating, it's a little harder to probably have a, a potter's wheel that goes along with you. But uh, uh, I wonder if, if there, there was a, a distinct reason to move away from that or if you were more, um, uh, I guess, I don't know if inspired is the right word, but uh, moved to do uh, what you're doing now. Oh man, that's, that's so great. I'm so glad that they have a good home with you, all my little pots and vases and such. Um, yeah, I taught ceramics um, at Rock Canyon High School for seven years. That was mainly what I taught and I loved it. But um, yeah, moving is definitely a problem. You know, it's so much easier to move paintings than boxes with carefully packed vases, you know, vases and bowls and such. And a kiln is also a problem and a wheel is a problem. I, th those are definitely factors. In fact, Jackie and I were just talking about like getting a wheel. Um, and I'm like, that's great. We could get a wheel, but then we'd need a kiln <laughs> and space. And in LA, you know, space is really tough. But um, I miss it, man. I, I wish I could get my hands dirty again in, in the clay and make some stuff. One of the things I love about ceramics is that it was so physical. You know, you had to really work the clay and center it and wedge it. And it was a workout. I almost wish, wish painting was more of a workout. Um, I think that's why I like plain air painting so much and stretching linen canvases. <laughs> um, it's very tactile. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> Bernard with the jokes. I, no, it wasn't a joke. It was real. It's yeah, style, you know, it is. It is. I just stretched three monsters, uh, linen canvases, and I didn't have canvas pliers, and I couldn't go to sleep, you know, easily that night because my hands felt like I'd smashed them with hammers. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what was I thinking? Um, yeah, I I do want to get back into pottery. I love it. I think that's just part of my my creative set, like rhythm. I like to try everything and, and, and play. I, I, that's, that's the core of it, Jesse, is I love to play. And that when I'm playing, I make my best work, you know, and, and staying fresh is part of that. Um, I think in ceramics, it was really fun for me to play in the studio because I would leave it open late at night. I'm talking late. I'd be teaching at Rock Canyon. I'd get there at like six, seven in the morning or whenever, I forget when school started, but early before school started, I'd get there and I'd be there late at night, you know, uh, throwing and Jackie would even get off work some nights from her job and meet me in the ceramic studio. And she learned how to throw on the wheel and there'd still be students there. And and it was a really cool space and i'd be like hey guys it's almost nine o'clock we gotta go home you know and i could tell they loved being there it was a community you know of creatives and people felt safe there and just like they could hang out all the time by the end they were like students were cooking pizzas in the kiln and stuff and i was like oh. <laughs> i created a monster um it was really really a great time and, and those are the memories I have of being in the ceramic studio. So definitely fond in my heart. Um, here's an example. This is my brush jar. A uh, bunch of little skulls all the way around. <laughs> love it, love it. Uh, yeah, raccoon fire. Yeah, I, I loved it. And I love the chemistry behind it. Um, it was fun. I remember a time when I, <laughs> I thought it was a really great idea to talk to Mr. Ferguson, who was the chemistry teacher at Rock Canyon and be like, hey, you know, we should switch classes for a day. Like uh, your students should come down and do some raku firing and my students can go up there and learn the chemistry behind it. It would be awesome. And in my head, it was really great until my students came back and they were like, why did you send us to chemistry? <laughs> I was like, oh, I thought it would be cool. You, you know, the chemistry behind it all. They did not appreciate that. Um, <laughs> did, did you use asbestos gloves? 
Especially, oh, for the, no. For, no, the, no, for, the, for the raccoon? No, no. And in fact, it was kind of cool because it was snowing in Colorado and we'd fire it in the kiln and we'd open up the kiln and with great big tongs, you'd take out red hot pottery and just put it in the snow and it didn't crack. You know, I, I, I'd done this before, but it was, <laughs> it was dynamic and, you know, steaming everywhere. And yeah, kids got thrilled out of it as much as I did, I think. Wonderful. Yeah. I, I, I genuinely love teaching art. And I realized at a certain point, I needed to make more art um, than teaching would allow me to. And uh, now I'm looking for a balance. Hopefully I can teach art again while still being able to make art. And I think I'll be able to do that with um, an art center here. Uh, it's called the Palos there, this art center. And hopefully um, if they like what I can do, I'll be teaching there more often. You're doing um, a workshop up there? I did two workshops. I did one online with adults and then again with kiddos. Um, and it went well. Good. Um, yeah, the feedback was good. So fingers are crossed. We'll see. And uh, yeah, I, I just, my, you know, uh, for those of you that don't know, I guess I can tell everybody. My wife and I were expecting our first kiddo. Uh, oh. Ah, oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. So in, in January 24th, uh, and I feel like never before has a sense of urgency been upon me. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so yeah. my efforts. And uh, yeah, I really need to uh, get things um, figured out, you know? <laughs> yeah, nothing will be the same again. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh my God. Very exciting. In a good way. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So we're here, obviously, thrilled. Congrats, Dan, man. It's, hey, it's your best you. creation ever. It's it's your best Absolutely. creation. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, it's built a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm just like, oh my God, I I need to talk to some artists like that have kiddos and be like, how do you guys do it? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> talk to Annette. She just joined. Yeah. Annette, yeah. You guys got any tips? Let me know. Uh, how do you, how do you, uh, how were you still productive as an artist with kiddos running around? Babysitters. <laughs> yeah, babysitters. Definitely. Babysitters. All right. I know. When I was sculpting. I let my kids sculpt with me. Oh, there you go. And I left their fingerprints in it. Love it. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's that's awesome. I I feel like I've talked to some artists and they were like, oh, I switched to acrylics, you know, they're safer. And I'm like, oh, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I will lock the kiddo in, in a safe place. Well, they, they just have... had uh, uh, Dia del Muertos down here and uh, they had quite the display over here at the churches down here. And so I, I told uh, Annette, who just, I think she just joined, about the displays that they had. And I told her that you were an artist of one of those. And uh, maybe you could design a piece for her someday. Yeah, I'm always taking commissions. I think now more than ever, I'm like, yeah, give me, give me all the business. Need them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but actually, Daniel, uh, I actually switched to pastels uh, after my first kid was born because he would wander into the studio and uh, while I wasn't paying attention to him he'd stick his hand in the phthalo green or the phthalo <laughs> blue and then stumble out into the house and <laughs> rub it all over the walls <laughs> and, <laughs> at that point I stopped doing oils and I switched over to pastels so yeah uh, it it can be um uh, life changing. <laughs> yeah. it, it will also help feed the tactile beast, Daniel. Get your fingers dirty. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've been around. You heard it, Daniel. You heard it from them. It might be time to, to transition over, but uh, hey, yeah. we're not going to push anything. You know, we'll, we'll wait a year. We'll wait a year and see how you feel after that. 
I'm working on them, David. <laughs> <laughs> Pastel Society invited me so kindly, and I was like, yeah, it's been a really great community. Like, I love, that's, that's the thing I've learned. Like, I've been a lone wolf, like I say, like, just I've been doing artwork on my own forever, because I, I just was like, oh, I gotta do it. And in Seattle, I remember going back and forth to the studio that I had at a beam, the, this place called the Bemis Building. And I was so grumpy. I was not liking living in Seattle. We had just moved there. And every day I'd come back home, you know, I'd, the dogs would go with me. And Jackie, my wife, she's like, what's the matter? Like, why are you? I'm like, oh, I don't like Seattle. And she's like, you need to take a class. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I, I looked up classes and that's where I found Juliet Aristides um, uh, Atelier. And, and that's one of the first times I ever really was introduced to an art community. Oh. And, and I was like, holy smokes, I found my people, you know? And there's this really weird thing that happens when you find your people. It's like a sense of belonging and, and, um, you know, a sense of, it, it kind of elevates your game in a way. At the Atelier, there was a different, different sense of camaraderie. I, I feel like people were all, they were really good people there, but they were very competitive. They were very focused. They were doing their own thing. And I'm like, okay, I get it. And then we, we moved here to LA after moving to Tucson. And, and instantly, the art community was welcoming with open arms. I was like, holy smokes, what is this? Like, this is insane. Katha Anderson was one of the first people I met. And she's like, oh, you got to join the Pastel Society of America. I'm like, I don't do pastel. She's like, I don't care. You should join. And, <laughs> and it's been such a warm welcome. And it's really changed how I, how I think of, um, of, of these art guilds and art communities, you know? Um, I find myself wanting to contribute more and be involved more. Um, yeah, and and this has been like the warmest welcome. So I I really appreciate what the Pastel Society has done. Um, you know, just welcoming welcoming me into their art community. And so yes, I will do um, a pastel drawing of these calaveras. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get some good paper to do that. Yeah. <laughs> It's waiting for you over here, Daniel. Awesome. <laughs> I will pick it up. So I think you guys can see how this little calavera is looking really silly. And, you know, I've worked um, on these warm colors um, to kind of render and suggest, you know, here's a little guy hanging upside down, waving hi to this cow. This composition came from a postcard that I did, you know, just silly. I feel like, um, you know, somebody was talking earlier about like, oh, you when you were sketching, who who was saying, was that Christine? You, you were saying about like you sketched a cat, like a. Uh, oh no, it wasn't me. Uh, I think was it was Lynn. Lynn. Yeah, Lynn. it was Lynn. Yeah, and so you come up with these really creative ideas, right? And it, it sounded like kind of like a Kim Jong Ji drawing, you know, like. Uh, I, and that's what popped in my head. And and Kim Jung Ji and Carl Kapinski are these really prolific draftsmen that I admire, and they draw every day. And I'm going, man, I got to figure out a way to do that, to really exercise my creativity. And um, I'll I'll get on these kicks where I'll do like a postcard a day for like a month, and then I'll feel you know just deflated afterwards. I'm like, oh my god, I'm never gonna do that again. Um, <laughs> But, but I do think um, those kind of challenges are really helpful for creativity. And, and you know, um, I, I like that. I like sketching with other artists. It's fun. Um, I miss figure drawing. I haven't been able to do any figure drawing in a long time, you know? <laughs> and so I'm really kind of still waiting for the world to open up. Um, I'm here in LA and you know, figure drawing classes, I feel, are all online still. Um, uh, there are, there's actually some physical um, life drawing classes available. Really? You're blowing my mind right now. So we'll, well, we'll connect uh, afterwards. Well, I don't want to broadcast it because um, <laughs> it's very limited. But, uh, you know, maybe we can talk during the week. All right. 
Yeah. That's I'm not sorry. I'm not trying to be exclusive, folks, but it's kind of limited. Yeah, um, I get it. Sounds very exclusive. I think I want to uh, definitely audition. Well, for I'm it. not being esoteric about it. <laughs> I'm just saying it's yeah. kind of it's happening in certain areas. But you know, uh, they'll only accept five or six people at a time. That's oh. what I'm talking about. Gotcha. So it's all about the COVID. Yeah, yeah, and I like. I got to be careful with that too, because I had a pulmonary embolism. Like, actually, when I was teaching at Rock Canyon High School, like one of the summers, I had, I thought it would be, you know, during the summers I would go to this to the school. I'm just gonna back up the camera now. Um, I'd go to the school and I'd make pottery during the summer. I'm like, wow, I got a classroom. I have a studio. This is awesome. And on my way down from the apartment, I had forgotten like my wallet or something. And I got my bicycle, I was gonna ride there. And I'm like, oh crap, I gotta go back upstairs. So I run upstairs and my arm looks red. And I'm like, wow, what is happening? And I had slept on the floor the night before just cause it was cooler on the floor. And, and I'm like, okay, like I'll just, uh, you know it's because I slept on my arm wrong. But then it started to puff up and I'm like, ooh, that, that's weird. And it felt really uncomfortable. So I was like, ah, this is weird. So I'm just going to stay home. And at that time, my friend, Chris Molinette, uh, this guy from, from Douglas um, that I went to high school with, he was like, hey, get online. You know, we'll play Call of Duty. And I'm horrible at video games. So I have this headphones on here. I'll do this so you guys can see me. Um, so I have these headphones on and I'm like playing or just really watching Chris play, but I'm sitting down on the floor. I got my elbow on a stack of pillows and I'm drinking a bottle of wine. Cause he was like, yeah, maybe you pinched a vein and you need to like let the blood thin to go through your pinched vein. And so I'm just drinking wine, watching him play Call of Duty. And my wife comes home and she's like, Hey, and I'm like, Hey, you're home early. And I'm drunk. And cause I drank the whole bottle and she's just like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I, I don't know. And she was like, oh my God, your arm. And, and Chris just remembers hearing, we're going to the hospital. And I'm like, what? And, he, and I'm like, bye, Chris. And we go to the hospital, we get there and they immediately like send me to the emergency room and they're like putting like blood thinners in me. And they're like, oh my God, what? And they, to this day, they don't know what caused the, the pulmonary embolism it was a blood clot in my lung and in my arm oh my gosh. and wow. yeah and I didn't know and I was just so green and dumb you know and anyway yeah so Jackie came home early that day and like saved my life the doctor, yeah <laughs> I was like oh and when was this Daniel uh 2000 what is it 2010 yeah 2010 Whoa, that's scary yeah, yeah, that was that was a wake up call. I was like, I'm only eating veggies, and they were like, No, 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 you have really thick blood. You should avoid a lot of vitamin K. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, because vitamin K promotes clotting. So, yeah. oh, yeah. So, yeah, I I feel like um, I take lung issues very seriously, like uh, you know, COVID, the pulmonary, Good thing. right, blood thinners. Yeah, so I'm going to actually turn my camera back a little. Or oh, you know what? I could just move my easel back. That way you guys get a better view. I'm going to paint more of the landscape. And this is what I mean. Like these Calavera paintings, they're like, oh, you paint the details last. And I'm like, well, not all the time. Because <laughs> I like to get this guy, since he's a light source, I want to get him, for the most part, you know, to a... To a a, a place where I can say, hey, that's my light source and I know where light is shining. So once I have that, then I can go back and really have fun painting the rest of this. You know, I won't be able to finish the painting tonight. Um, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing good on time. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we've got uh, 15, but if you want to go extra, we were talking about this, Daniel and I, if everybody would like to see Daniel paint a little bit more, we could probably go a little bit longer than our usual time, which is an hour and a half. We were thinking maybe going two hours. Is that right, Daniel? 
Yeah. And wow. Fine. I, I have some really great stories from, I don't know, my upbringing on the Navajo reservation and along the US Mexico border that I could That'd be great. Share sure. and like say, like, how some of these paintings kind of reflect that, you know? Um, <laughs> well, not everybody knows your background. So, oh, yeah. So yeah, that's, maybe we should cover that a little bit. Good, good point. Um, you know, I grew up on the Navajo reservation when I was real little, and that was, uh, you know, no running water. Like, we hadn't, like, uh, I don't know, it, it was, people still to this day don't have running water on the res, you know, they still have to pull it. And it's just kind of a third world country in, in America that people don't realize. Um, but I, I, I look back and it's magical, my time there, you know? And, and I've revisited Canyon de Shea and the Navajo res often um, just to check it out and get, get inspiration from there. It's a beautiful place and I'd recommend you guys if you ever get a chance to check it out. Um, by the way, this is Indian yellow. It's a very transparent yellow that this is a gray underpainting. And I'll just use the Indian yellow to glaze it really. And it kind of has that nice immediately, like looks like a glowing it's area. Very transparent. This is the Indian yellow produced mm -hmm. in the Indian subcontinent by feeding uh, camels with um, mango leaves. I thought it was cattle, but uh, really? it, it could have been cattle. And then they collected the urine and boiled it down. And it produced this uh, very transparent, bright yellow pigment. <laughs> that yeah. is so interesting. <laughs> that is. Uh, this is wow. They don't know about this Indian yellow. Oh, it's no, <laughs> that's crazy. Who's like, I'm going to take this urine and make it into a paint. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Never done that before again. Oh, man, you make your own paints. No, um, they actually don't do that anymore. Like they oh. do synthetically now. Um, but it's <laughs> yeah, that's how it used to be. just like kaput mortem it used to be made out of mummies. But like, yes, you know, that's right. There's a, there's a very interesting gray. Yeah, they don't do that anymore. They don't do that anymore. <laughs> so Daniel, this I find that very Daniel. fascinating, you know, especially after seeing all the cave paintings that I went to see mm -hmm. and just like uh, understanding the pigments that they used for, you know, creating these paints that lasted thousands of years. Yeah. It's crazy. Oh, Amazing. yeah. It's that's something I've been really interested in. I was talking with an artist. Oh God, I forget his name. He's really prolific though, and uh, does some great work. He makes his own flake white, and that blew me away. I was like, what? Really? Yeah, out of lead. Lead. Wow. Lead. Yeah. <laughs> he lets some oxidize, and then he like gets the, and he he mixes like grit in there and stuff. And I'm like, man, that seems like. I very tempting, but I, I better not because I could be poisonous. Yeah. Yeah, it could be poisonous. Yeah, it's lead. And and also I I get kind of not manic, but that's not the wrong word. I, I get very, very tunnel vision sometime. And I'm like, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna figure this out. <laughs> and, and like I oh, I was gonna share this with you. I like I oh, well, uh, hold on for a second, Daniel. I think we're having an issue with your phone. I think you might yeah, be low phone, on battery. Your phone's not showing. There we go. There you go. Sorry, let me plug it in. No worries. Yeah, I, I, I did that recently with my own panels. I was like, wow, I really like, you know, Claussen's linen, you know, a specific type of linen. And, you know, it's oil primed. I want to I want to paint on panels. So I was trying to make my own using like aluminum. <laughs> so here's here's one I can show you. Um, yeah. Ah. So aluminum, uh, that's sandwiching some plastic. Um, okay. this I've is, seen that before. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're really great. And the only problem, it, they're perfect. They came out really great. Is that, I don't know if you could see it. They're kind of rippled, barely rippled. I mean, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. That's that's from the humidity, I think, because I used oh. a uh, an archival glue that's water based, and 
anyway, I'm like, why am I doing that? Like, why do I care? Like, why am I making my own panels? Like, I need, I need a paint. Like, <laughs> so I went down this whole rabbit hole of looking all over LA for like the best deal for a four foot by eight foot aluminum panel and then like getting linen and gluing it. Like, what am I doing? I need a paint. So um, Daniel, Daniel, you were talking about the Navajo reservation. I actually spent two weeks on the res about four years ago. And we were in, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Tis Nos Pos? Oh, uh, yeah, I know where that is. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that's like, uh, I can't even say it. I used to know Navajo words and stuff. Gosh, so it was like a service trip where we were actually building, like building wheelchair ramps and helping some of the residents paint their houses and just like helping out and, our guy, our guy that we helped, his name was John and we were painting his porch. And his kids were going off and his grandkids going off to school and losing some of the language. And he was frustrated that they were losing the Navajo language. Yeah. So, you know, he felt very strongly that that needs to be passed down and I agree. And I know there were dogs running everywhere. There were res dogs. So we wanted to sleep outside under the stars but we were worried about the res dogs. <laughs> like attacking us in the night. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh yeah. But it was a, an incredible experience, and I really felt like uh, we got to know the culture and the people, and um, it was really great. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. I want to organize like a like a a, a painting day, like in the canyon, like. Oh, it'd be awesome. On horseback, and I know the. the oh, I'd like it. Oh yeah, Chris and I are there. We're horse people. Yeah, sign me up. Sign me up. <laughs> sign it up. What I'm, what town are you from, Daniel? What town? A place, a place called Chin Lee, Arizona. Okay, um, Chin Lee. It's right at the mouth of Canyon de Shea. And okay. um, yeah, I actually was okay. You guys ready for this? This is yeah. like my thing line. Um, I was born in Casa Grande, Arizona. Whoa. To the Navajo Reservation just before kindergarten. Then we moved from there, where did we go? To California, mm. uh, Alta Loma. And then from there to Virginia, and then from Springfield, Virginia, to Phoenix, Arizona, and then Phoenix, Arizona to Douglas. And then from Douglas, I went moved to Colorado. But like Douglas is where I went to high school and that's where my father's and mother's ranch was. So most summers we'd go back to Douglas, Arizona mm. uh, to work on the ranch. And then we'd, you know, visit the res. Um, yeah, so the res and Douglas, Arizona is where I spent most of my time. And that's where I call home. Um, yeah. Wow, it, that's great. That yeah. whole lifestyle is really, really cool. I don't know what my dad was running from, but like. <laughs> <laughs> he kept moving you around. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, where are we going? Um, and some days it's like without notice, it's like, pack up your bags, we're, we're moving. I'm like, what? No. <laughs> <laughs> like as a kid, you know, you're like, what, what are we doing? Like, what? You know, oh, so this is something I like to do. I, this is an example of me playing around. Like I'm using a lot of green in the saguaro and, and yeah, I like the cool colors, but I'll, I like to splash a little bit of red in there just to like um, play with the, the senses and let help the colors dance a little bit, you know. Um, and I'll I'll poke at this and I'll I'll just play around with it. And it's very not the method you're supposed to use at the atelier. I, I don't think um, you know. There's this is just playing around, and this is all like base colors. And after I do the base colors, I'll then go another pass and do details. Um, yeah. But I, I love the res and looking back now, it's uh, super fond, um, the memories I have there. You know, um, I learned to really love the desert, I think growing up on the res when I was little. My dad would take my brother and I on like these walkabouts <laughs> and it'd be like storming outside or something. And he'd be like sitting us down during the storm. He's very like, uh, you know, spiritual in that, in that way and he's like just listen to the rain you know and and uh no like i remember one time my 
my dad took me out in the desert at night, pitch black. And he's just like, all right, like, uh, you're going to walk back to the house now. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, that light way over there. That's the house. You can do it. And I'm thinking like, what? And he's, you know, I was a little kid. I think I was like in first grade, second grade, maybe, maybe second grade. Yeah. I think I was in second grade. And, and I just remember he would give me a little pep talk. He's like, you're the strongest thing in this desert. Like, like uh, javelina and coyotes, they're afraid of you. Like, you just have to like, you know, walk back home. And I remember thinking like, I am the strongest thing in the desert. <laughs> you know, I had a rock in my hand and I was going to walk all the way back home. And I did. And I'm like, looking back, I'm like, wow, you know, that was, that was just unorthodox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just weird things like that. And, you know, um, my, my chore growing up was like, we had pecan trees at the ranch and, and um, like you, they were saplings, like really little pecan trees and the rabbits would come in during the evening and they would uh, chew the bark off the trees. And so it was, it was my chore to like get my 22 and lay down and shoot these rabbits that would come in and then skin them and feed them to the dogs. And if I, if I got a cottontail and if it was winter, then, you know, he, he'd like, okay, we might have that. But I remember like, that was my chore, you know, <laughs> I was like, I don't like, I was in elementary school. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. And it persisted all the way through high school. I was like, but I, you know, I, once the trees got bark on them, I was like, wait, I don't need it. Rabbits, I can't even eat them. And I would just fall asleep outside in the dirt, like with my little 22 on, on my chest. And um, one time I was asleep and it had gotten kind of dark. And I remember hearing some rustling next to me. And I was like, what is that? And, and I, I wake up and there's a javelina and three little baby javelinas right next to it, but maybe five feet from me. And I'm grunting and kind of making some noise so that they could go away. And I'm like, ur, ur, and they don't care at all. And so finally I stood <laughs> up as this thing was getting closer and closer. And I, and that javelina just bolted. It flew out of there and it was running and it jumps were like, you know, <laughs> 10 feet apart or something. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And one little javelina just stayed behind. And I'm like, no, get out of here, go home. <laughs> And it was following me around and I was wanting to go back to the house. And um, so I remember kind of like running in a big circle so that it could meet up, you know, with its uh, mother and siblings. You know, I didn't want it to follow me back to the house. Like, these wow. little, yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know how I'm going to paint that, you know, <laughs> like that there's little stories and narratives that I want to paint. Like, I'm working on one now where a badger, well, I, like we had to go and get the cattle because they had gotten out of the, the, the property. They had broken a fence. And so I, I remember my dad waking my brother and myself up at like four and he's like, hey, you gotta, you gotta go get the cattle before they get to the highway. And we're like, oh, okay. And we're out there. <laughs> and as I'm walking with like two PVC pipes stretched out in my arms, you know, just trying to like uh, usher the cattle back to the ranch and herd them back, they start parting. They, the, the herd like starts separating and it's kind of foggy. And, and, and in the middle was this badger just slinking its way on the desert floor with its fur just trotting. And it didn't even care that it was like, walking by cattle and me it couldn't care less and I was I was just shocked I was like wow look at that badger it's so badass like <laughs> um yeah those little moments I I'm like I gotta figure out a way to paint those you know in, in either my western art or in my calavera art you know I think that'd be wonderful thanks yeah so you've You've seen this kind of painting kind of come together a little bit. Um, down here are the prickly pear that I was talking about, how they are going to kind of make the viewer feel like they're peering into this moment. And yeah. 
I just love the design of these horns like coming up and the skeleton going down. I think they complement each other really nice. Yeah, I like it. Thanks. I'll definitely put some more stars in there, um, but th not sprinkled, just uh, singular, you know, with a little kind of halo because there's moisture in the air. And I I've been liking that effect lately, the little glow effect. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. I wanted to ask earlier, like, about creativity, because I'm really interested and how people come up with their paintings and you know if if they've ever you know if they find like painting really challenging and to try and kind of change the paradigm so it's fun again like what do they do anyone want to answer that question I mean, I can give an example. Like I, I've been wanting to paint and create artwork um, with with friends of mine and stuff. I think that can like make it really fun for me again, um, in a way, because there are lurches. You know, you're like, oh, I, I gotta like paint. <laughs> you know, it's not all like the biggest and brightest. And then there's a whole after you paint it, like you gotta move it. You gotta try and find it a home and sell it. And that's a whole different beast. You know. You know, honestly, I think one of the things that really helps me is the Zoom thing. <laughs> I mean, and actually just watching you helps me become more creative. It, it's a very inspiring. Oh, we got to do it more often. You get, you hear that pastel society. I think every Thursday they do, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we do other. every other Thursday. Every other Thursday. Yeah. And you guys can like, uh, I don't know, you guys can like throw your hat in, right? Like um, if you're an artist. Yeah, anybody can sponsor or host one of these meetings, which is really cool and really fun. And I agree, Chris, it is great to watch these. And I mean, Daniel, you're so much fun. Like you're getting my creative juices flowing and like that sushi cat painting I told you I did was way departure from anything I'd ever done. And I it was that. fun. And I think sometimes if you just go to your studio or go outside and play, it just, and take the pressure off of yourself to produce some masterpiece, that really gets you going. I think so too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's keep this going. Yeah, for let's sure. Going. Like, uh, yeah, I'm, I like, I, I was surprised how much I liked watching people paint. I, I think my the art one of the artists that I first followed was Carl Kapinski, this guy from Nottingham, whose accent is just a, a joy to listen to. But he's also freaking phenomenal. He is just the most amazing draftsman, and he's <laughs> so humble. And he's like, "Oh, I hope, I hope you guys like this." And meantime, <laughs> I'm blown away at what he's doing. Um, yeah, and. And that, that really, I was like, man, I'm really enjoying this. Where before I had doubts, you know, going live and kind of inviting people into my creative process with videos. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. But then I'm like, wow, I really enjoyed watching Carl do it. Like maybe, maybe, maybe I could participate. Oh, guess who's home? Hey, lady. She's finally home from work. So those of you that don't know, my wife, um, she works at SpaceX and, you know, they pull long hours there and uh, it's, it's nice that she can do something she loves also. You know, I was talking about this, her love for the cosmos and stuff like that. I don't know. Oh, you've been watching? Oh, that's awesome. She is my fiercest supporter. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. wonderful. <laughs> well, I hope this inspires more of our members and even non-members if you're interested we'd be more than happy to uh have a session where you know you get to paint or your theories your ideas um i think this is incredibly inspirational daniel i love your work and it's got such a great allegorical uh sense to it you know you tell these stories and then just even listening to the stories that you're telling 
uh, us, I could see them being painted as Calaveras or, you know, however you take them, but I, it's very inspirational. Thank you for doing this. Oh, it's a joy. I, I feel like there's, you know, there's a community here and it's really good to contribute to it. Um, you know, and the stories that kind of come up are, you know, they're fun and that's part of it. Uh, my friend Charles was on here earlier. He's a really great artist from, from, uh, was it? Well, from the Atelier also, he's in Seattle still. And, and there's a story that I shared with him that I think is safe to tell everybody here now. Um, and this is, this is a great one. So my landlord, he, he worked at the Pentagon at the, uh, as, as a pilot for a while. And then he just kind of came up to me. He's like, Hey, I got this idea. Um, I want you to paint a portrait of me and, uh, I'll sneak it into the Pentagon, into the gallery. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I am in. I will do this. Like, I'm going to like pause everything just to do this. And so I, I remember like painting him and he was like, oh, I want my mustache bigger. Oh, okay. And I'm like, oh, I want, I want my gun on my side. Oh, I want my airplane in the back. Oh, I want them out. And I'm like, oh my God. Okay. Like we got to finish this. And so finally I finished it. I sent it off. And um, like, <laughs> it was, I was like kind of holding my breath because that's when January 6th was going on and we didn't know what was happening. And, you know, long story short, he gets it and, and he had gotten the frame and all the hardware and he hangs it in the Pentagon and he sends me a picture of it. And I'm like, yeah, we did it. And then like six months later um, in New York and he says, hey, uh, did anybody contact you about the painting? And I'm like, no, man, like, what's going on? He says, oh, um, it's not there anymore. And I'm like, what? And I remember I put on the back of the painting, you know, I thought of this and I'm like, hey, uh, I, I, a really proper note, I have an old fashioned computer. So I typed it up, said on loan from, you know, his name, uh, from the collection of his name. And if, you know, please return, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, it has a note. And he's like, yeah, I took it off because I didn't want them to see it was me. I'm like, it's a portrait of you. Um, <laughs> so, and so anyway, he, um, he gets sent on this kind of wild goose chase to find this painting. And turns out he was kind of known as a prankster. And the people who identified him in the painting were like, oh my God, look at what this guy did. We're gonna send him, we're gonna prank him. And so they sent him on this wild goose chase just to tell him, we really like the painting. We want to officially accept it into the, our gallery here, you know, officially. And so that was great. What a relief. Oh my gosh. And, <laughs> and then later, um, you know, fast forward a few months, um, one month, I think. And I'm in, where was I? Montana. I'm in Montana at the, at the CM Russell art show. And I was really happy. I got into this art, Western art, auction and I had two paintings in there and Jackie and I were at dinner with some collectors and other artists at the show and this guy sitting across from me you know uh I I was just having a good conversation with him and I tell him hey I got a story and I tell him this story and he goes wait before I finish he was like wait 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 what, what do you say like my wife's the uh, deadpan he was like you better watch what you say my wife's secretary of the Air Force. Yeah. So deadpan, I don't know if you heard that, but deadpan, he was like, you better watch what you say because my wife is the former secretary of the Air Force. And I'm like. Uh, the hell she was. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, uh, okay. Like, anyway, I finished telling the story. And then, you know, later, I, you know, he ends up buying one of my paintings, which is really cool. And uh, I look him up and his wife was, What's her name? Barbara? Barbara Barrett. Barbara Barrett, the undersecretary of the, no, no, the, the secretary of the Air Force. And Whoa. so I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I had no idea who he was. And I was telling him about like break, you know, how my painting got into the Pentagon. <laughs> watch what you say at dinner. Yeah. So watch what you say at dinner. That's funny. Moral of the story. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. You know, yeah. I think that's I, I've had a hard time getting my artwork into museums, but if that's the way I have to do it, 
that's the way I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is a good first pass. You can see like all of the canvases or board is completely covered. And my next pass will be, you know, more details, more, uh, more studies on where I want the light to hit and where I really want it to um, pass through or something. And I hope you enjoyed this little demo. And I hope you enjoyed this little peek behind the curtain into my studio. Um, we can stop this camera and I can just talk to you guys and just say uh, from uh, my studio to you guys, a very sincere thank you for your time. And yeah, I'm, I'm just really, really so thankful that I got to share my, my art with you all. Yeah, we're, we're blessed. Thank you so much for doing this for us. And it was great to see your process and how you're, you're working and come up, coming up with your ideas. So we're, we're, we're really appreciative. I mean, if you want to sign off now, uh, we're a little bit over our time, only like 10 minutes, but oh, okay. um, like, it's entirely up to you if you want to keep going or if you I'm, are out I'm of too, stories. <laughs> I, I just don't want to obligate like people to stay. I, I got tons of stories to tell and I could stay on for, you know, 20, 30 more minutes um, answering questions and such. Well, I think sometime, Daniel, we need to do a take two, Daniel part two. And, uh, you know, let the fun continue. This was really, yeah. really awesome. It's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you, Dan, for sharing so much. You are all very welcome. I, I love that part two. You've been very generous with the creative process, even though you didn't produce a single pastel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Yes, yes, yes right. Bernard, but we did talk about it. Yeah, yeah right. that could be part two, Bernard. Don't yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, Daniel, get the bloody pastels out. Does charcoal count? Does, does no, charcoal count? No. Like, I'm so, good. I, I have a lot of charcoals, you know. Well, yeah. I, I think you're good for part two, uh, as um, uh, everybody else has said, with, with pastels, because it's a different medium. Yeah. Uh, uh, and how you react to that medium. Yeah, and mm, I, I don't know, fun. figurative or, you know, something else. Whatever it is, yeah. Ghouls that, or... I said I'd I come back to, to watch that. that. <laughs> <laughs> you pay to see me struggle with, with pastels? <laughs> you have a, you have a fan base now, so... You won't be alone. <laughs> the definition of struggle is pastels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I, I had like a little test piece of the sandpaper because I had one like a little, you got, you know, Pastel Society does these really great things where they like send, you know, a raffle and I won like some pastels. And I was like, woohoo. And I was so excited. <laughs> I, I got them and I had a little piece of sandpaper. I was testing it out, doing a little figurative drawing and it looked really great. And then I turned in my studio in, in my garage in just the right way to see a beam of light just highlighting all the particles in there. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I've been breathing this stuff in. And so- well, well, that was God talking. Yeah, that freaked me out a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I've gotten really used to wearing a mask if I need to, but I've, I also learned that you can kind of paint with the pastels too, using alcohol. Mm -hmm. water. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can use pencils too. They don't do that so much. Yeah, there's all kinds of things. There's all kinds of medium, mediums, media. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and there's various surfaces that have been adapted so that past, pastel pastelistas, uh, pastel mm -hmm. artists can play around beforehand to, you know, smudge and smear and all that kind of good stuff and they get down to the real business of using the sticks so but anyway daniel thank you very much you've shared an awful lot of good stuff with us and great stories and i think this is just the end of part one so yeah me too yeah mm -hmm. i agree uh daniel uh before you sign off do you want to uh make me the host and i'll say our goodbyes to everyone i think we're gonna 
oh, close goodness. shop here very soon. Hey, Dan, uh, can I ask a quick question? This is off topic. Uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Carolyn. All that, yeah, all that is Cosmo. Um, are you going to the 2024 Total Eclipse of the Sun? That's uh, the last um, one in the United States in our lifetime. Eclipses? You, you're not eclipse person. Then just more <laughs> meteor shower, dude. Oh, no, I love eclipses. In fact, we when when it was happening, when we had a full eclipse, we were in Seattle and we actually went out to go check it out. Um, yeah, I'll have to look that up. I that's uh, I think it's April 8th, 2024. And so the one you're talking about in Seattle, my husband and I went to see we're in Wyoming for that. And oh, nice. uh, I'm a big eclipse freak. That's the last one, April 8th, 2024. And it's going to go oh. down like instead of across, it's going to slice down from the East Coast and hit all the way to Mexico. But I think the best place to see it would probably be Austin or San Antonio, Texas, because it's April. So you'll get less the chance of a clear sky. Awesome. Just throwing that out there. I appreciate <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, and your wife works at SpaceX. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. She's way cooler than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> but cool. Anyhow, thank you for All everything. Right. It was wonderful. Yeah. All right. Well, you guys are so welcome. I'm trying to figure out how to make you the, the host again. How do I do that? I'm clicking. Should be under. Uh, Scroll here. down to the bottom. Yeah. <sighs> Should be right on your panel. I'm scrolling down. All it says is uh, share screen, chat, participants. Do you see those three bubbles next to your name? Um, next to my name. In your icon, you should be able to. Oh, yeah. Uh, hide self, rename. What do I need to do? Pin, hide self, rename. Does it give you the option to go back to host? No, but I also am using my iPad, so I wonder if it was. Yeah, that's probably. Yeah, that was the one. Okay, so share content. Um, sorry, guys, I'm trying to do this. Technical difficulties. I know. Yep. So well, I'll sign off and thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you, everybody. We'll um, see you at the taken. We'll see you in two weeks. Uh, Christine Obers will be uh, joining us. Uh, Boy, we're tough act it. to follow. Yeah, well, <laughs> you're a you're a good act to follow for sure. I think we're, we're looking forward. To yeah. it, so. and um, I, I, I'd like to make a plug that I hope we'll see many of you on the 10th of November for the VIP event with the 12th annual uh, member exhibition that we've got with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I know, David, it might be a little bit hard for you to make it over here, so uh, <laughs> you get a pass on that one. Um, but we've yeah. got some I really wish I could be there. planned for that evening, and uh, our uh, Mary Eslin is actually going to uh, give a little talk and presentation on judging a competition, and she is the judge for um, our current exhibition. That's so I wanted to get that plug in because I'd love to see as many of you as possible. Oh, uh, yeah, please do. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you, Kath. Thank you for and, announcing that. Uh, see some of you guys at the take-in on Saturday? Yes, you'll see me. <laughs> Good. Uh, Daniel, awesome. are you part of the take-in on Saturday, the Pastel yep. Society? Yes, I'll be there. Oh, wonderful. Okay. We'll see you then. And great. thanks again for your spectacular entertainment. <laughs> You're welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you, right. Daniel. We appreciate it. Thank thanks you. for your time. Bye, Thanks everyone. so much. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye, Daniel, I just want to say this the painting you're doing makes me want to go camping, man. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I've been feeling like that, you know, with the brisk air. Oh, I want to go. Camping. Thanks, man. Uh, Gabe, you got to get back and pick up your paintbrushes or you can do pastels now, too. <laughs> it's been a while. I think the last time I painted was with you, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's been a while. Yeah. yeah. And Anna, it's been over two years. Anna, Anna's doing good too. Yeah, she's doing good. She's still in here or no? I don't no, I don't see her now. I think she left. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Yeah. Well, you have a good one, man. All Thanks right. For this. Bye, Thanks. everyone. Bye, bye, bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.